Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this special edition of Bang the Book Radio. I'm joined by Christian Pina of the Sports Gambling Podcast. We're going to chat about UFC Fight Night 152 or UFC on ESPN Plus 10 for the main event of Rafael Dos Anjos and Kevin Lee. If you missed our Preakness podcast with Brian Blessing on Wednesday, I highly recommend you check that out. If you missed Thursday's edition of the Betters Box, my MLB betting podcast, I also recommend you check that out. we got a lot of great stuff going on over at bangthebook.com right now for the NBA and NHL playoffs, a preview of tonight's Black Eyed Susan Stakes over at Pimlico Racecourse, and also a preview of the Preakness at bangthebook.com for this weekend, and Christian's preview for UFC Fight Night 152 as we bring him onto the show here. Christian Pina of the Sports Gambling Podcast. How's it going today, man? Good, buddy. It was a it was a fun uh, UFC pay per view event last time out. Big play on Anderson Silva over two and a half rounds would look to be cruising there. And some things you just can't handicap with a, you know, a sad way for a legend to potentially go out in front of you know fans like that. But um, pretty much everything else did come in, so um, it was a good event, you know. And and we just keep on going forward. We have a break next week, but I think this is. I mean, my God, I feel like we're we're talking, what out of. I mean, there's only been, what, two weeks, I think, that we haven't talked since the start of this kind of uh, ESPN deal. So we're rocking and rolling. Yes, sir. I think so. And uh, nice to get the Memorial Day weekend off. Hopefully all of our listeners out there enjoy the time, the unofficial start of summer in most parts of the country with uh, you know cookouts and all that type of thing. So hopefully you enjoy the week off next week and the weekend off next week as well. But Christian, let's talk about this card here again. UFC Fight Night 152, UFC on ESPN plus 10, whatever the hell you want to call it. From Rochester, New York, and and you and I were talking about this a little bit before we hit the record button here. We have not had a lot of events in New York, so do we have some unknowns from a judging standpoint here? Yeah, much like gambling becoming legal, uh, people kind of somewhat forget that mixed martial arts uh, just became legal in New York not too long ago, and so they're kind of in the infancy of that as well. It's you know, something the old guard looked at as kind of, uh, dare I say, human cockfights, I believe was the term that was used by their governor at the time. And, you know, it's come a long way, much like legalized sports betting and legalized mixed martial arts. I mean, you talk about the, you know, people always talk about the business that sports gambling and handicapping could be. But to give up on this multi-billion dollar company like UFC, not even just UFC, but Bellator, um, LFA, all these type of stuff, Invicta even, um, it, it did not make much sense for something that's going, that is legal in what, 49 other states, whatever it is now. So it's, it didn't make a lot of sense. I'm glad that they certainly made the the flip over. Um, but from a judging perspective, yeah, you know, we always, that's something we always kind of touch on, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. And there's not a lot to pull from when it comes to this, when it comes to New York, specifically, obviously Rochester, but usually just the one at MSG. So they're still in their infancy. Um, I, I wouldn't look at it as specifically New York judging is going to be bad or, or whatever. It's usually more on the other side of, of outside countries. Everything in the U.S. stays pretty much the same as towards their style once they've all adopted adopted the new rules and that can vary state by state a little bit until they kind of got the got everyone on the same footing one thing that we always talk about here with these UFC events whether they're in the U.S. or they're international a lot of times the matchmakers will put together local fighters give them a chance to you know go out there and fight in their native countries in their native states native regions whatever the case may be do we have any local fighters here on this card I mean, not really. Like you are, yeah, you would always think that like, there would be the the hometown boy, right? And it's, it's it can be a little bit difficult to pull that together, just because when you look at this, that's it can be hard, right? I mean, it's a little bit star studded, and then there's some other things out there that are mostly people from just around the U.S. I mean, we have a, a heavy dose of Brazil on this with Dos Anjos, Carlos Jr. making his return, Carlos Oliveira, Davi Ramos, so um, and. Um, Pereira. So it's not really anything straight up out of New York that you're going to see that's going to get that big pop of, you know, their guy. But, um, you know, it's just one thing that, again, I don't really look at it as if it was in Florida, if there was a Miami guy or, or whatever. I really kind of keep the U.S. as a whole very separate than I do and look at everything big picture from United States to Canada to Brazil to Russia or wherever they are at that time, Australia, whatever. All right, so we take a look here at this main event in the welterweight division. Rafael Dos Anjos taking on Kevin Lee. Dos Anjos, a small favorite. Some places have this as a coin flip with juice, depending on where you shop around. Of course, we're looking at these on Thursday afternoon, so the odds may have moved by the time you hear this on Friday. But Dos Anjos, generally speaking, minus 115, minus 20 favorite in that range. How's this line look to you, Christian? Yeah, it's a little bit weird when we look at this just because there's a little bit of an unknown when it comes to Kevin Lee. Um, This is going to be all about how he fares at this new weight class. I mean, the cut was really, 
you know, when people go up, we've seen this time and time again with Cerrone and, and all these other guys that when they don't have to kill themselves, um, they tend to perform better. That being said, the advantage that they have, and we can maybe talk about this later with a guy like Cummings, is they're usually the biggest guy in the division. That's the trade-off, right? They have such a size power because when you deplete yourself and then you can put all of that weight back on, people forget there's two actual weigh-ins. You know, when you see the ones and they're coming across the screen and the music's playing and Rogan's up there, that is about 24 hours post the real weigh-ins. So people are usually about, depending, you know, 10 to 15 to sometimes 25, 30 pounds heavier than they just were 24 hours ago. Um, so it's a very different type of situation. And when you look at Kevin Lee, I mean, finally, I think that this weight class is going to be good for him. He wasn't somebody who just relied on his size. Um, so at 155, you know, I think that this is very interesting. Kevin Lee is a guy who, you know, seems to all be the best at almost realizing his potential. When the lights are the brightest, he seems to somewhat falter. When you look at a guy like Dos Anjos at this weight class as well, I mean, this is really two former lightweights, which you don't see very often. And we know how one will perform at this weight class, but we don't know, you know, at welterweight, but we don't know how the other will. That being said, I do favor Kevin Lee in this spot. That also being said, I mean, when you're talking about guys like Colby Covington, Kamara Usman not being able to finish a guy like Dos Anjos, I'm hoping for a round prop and a two and a half, three and a half range to go over because I just don't see a way that Kevin Lee can kind of, um, you know, finish Dos Anjos. He's been through it all with everybody. Um, and I just, I don't see the finishing power coming from Lee for such a veteran like Dos Anjos. So I definitely think this one makes it to the scorecards, but I think that Kevin Lee is really going to be able to use that wrestling um, and kind of keep this fight where he wants to. And, and he is such, you know, people really don't think of him as, as good as he is. I think they think he's good, but he really could be some of the best in this division when it comes to wrestling. Now you're going to talk about him not having to cut those extra 15 pounds. It's a big name for Kevin Lee to get on his resume and start this journey for himself in a really good way. It's just, it's going to be really hard for Lee to finish this kind of across um, or inside the distance, I should say. Um, so I think the over makes a ton of sense. And I do favor Kevin Lee to get um, a, at least a split decision victory here. Well, and as we look at Dos Anjos here, five of his last six fights going the distance, not really the same thing for Lee. He's had a couple of long fights mixed in there, did have the long five-round decision with Ayakinta last December. What about that gas tank? You know, I mean, is this something where you would expect him to have a little bit more in the tank because he's obviously going to a weight he's more familiar with? Or do you worry about that with him, you know, fighting at a different weight to where maybe, you know, it kind of takes more of a toll on him in the cage? Yeah, I mean, Dos Anjos definitely will have the cardio advantage. There's no doubt about that. But when you look down the line at kind of Dos Anjos' opponents, again, you spoke about the decisions. Look, Usman is a decision machine. Much like Woodley, I've always talked about this. Covington, he's had some some finishes, but largely a grinder. Robbie Lawler took him to decision. Neil Magny, I mean, that's one. And Magny's always been kind of a, a decision guy for me as well. Um, but, I mean, even a guy like Tony Ferguson, decision. So, We've seen it kind of time and time again. I do worry maybe this gets finished in the championship rounds for Lee if that, you know, the over was going to be my play. Um, I definitely do think that there's just, when you're talking about the cardio issue, I think that the weight cutting comes into that as well. When you're not depleting yourself, you're giving yourself 15 extra pounds, you can work on that cardio and not have to kill yourself trying. So I think that the weight is, has a large part to why I think of that as well. All right, so we move on to the middleweight fight here. Antonio Carlos Jr. takes on Ian Heinish. And Carlos Jr., a minus 175 favorite here in this one. Again, uh, we are recording this on Thursday afternoon, so some of these lines could move around a little bit. But as you mentioned, pretty long layoff here. More than a year for Antonio Carlos Jr. Is he deserving of a favorite price of this magnitude? Yeah, I mean, when you look at this, I mean, the thing that if he wasn't hurt, I think that the layoff is largely irrelevant even for a guy um, like Carlos Jr. The injury is more what I would be concerned about over the layoff. We saw this, you know, we've seen guys come back off layoffs like this and some guys only fight once a year and they look great doing it and they move on. So he is in the midst of a, um, he's looking for his six win in a row, five fight win streak. And he's got back to basics for him. He is one of the best submission artists in the game. And that's what he has gotten back to doing and submitting uh, three, his last three in route to victory. When you look at a guy like Heinish, look, he is largely... Um, somebody who does a lot of things very good, but nothing really elite. And that is a, you know, a style to definitely get wins. We've seen this time and time again with, you know, somebody like Elias that I talked about. Uh, but look, his last five, he's four and one. So he's getting it done by any means necessary. The problem here for a guy like Heinish is if this mat hits the, if this fight hits the mat, it is a matter of if not 
Um, it is a matter of when, not if, this fight is going to be over via submission for Carlos Jr. And I just don't see Heimish being able to keep this on the feet as long as he wants to. Um, and so to me, I really would favor Carlos Jr. at this price. I do think it warranted the wrestling department, the takedowns, all that type of stuff. Is just This is a very much a striker versus grappler, not to sound, cl sound cliche, but the grappling advantage Carlos Jr. has is so much leaps and bounds over the striking advantage that Ian Heinish has. So um, while Heinish will like to keep, uh, keep this on the feet, the takedown defense, all that type of stuff um, does have about a 50% um, takedown defended range, but it, it's only going to take one for Carlos Jr. And I don't think Heinish gets back up. So I think it's uh, Carlos Jr. By, by submission in a very dominating performance. Now, I know that you're moving around decent money on these fights, certainly as, you know, as much as you can get down on them out there. I imagine most of our listeners aren't doing that. They're not limit bet types of guys. So here would be my question for somebody. You know, Carlos Jr. at minus 175, or do you take the better Carlos Jr. by submission price? Since you think that's his most likely path, at least when it comes to a stoppage victory. Obviously, he could win on the cards. That certainly wouldn't surprise anybody. But for somebody who you know maybe doesn't want to lay the dollar seventy five, do you advise they stay off the fight, or is it okay for them in certain instances to do something like a by submission by knockout type of price? Yeah, that's the thing, right? I think that when you're just starting out, I think that it makes a lot more sense to either flat bet it if, say, you want to risk one point one or minus one seventy and get back your point seven or point six, whatever that is. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I think that. That's one thing that a lot of people do when they're just starting out and they're kind of, I don't want to say get too cute, uh, but do too much too fast. If, you, if you're not familiar with passive victories, you know, it, it's one of those things where you can really call a fight the right way when you do props like that. And it just didn't happen. And he won a dominant decision because the submission just couldn't get it locked in in time or narrowly escaped or whatever the case may be. And so I tend to, you know, just have a, a very high standard for my money. And so I try to not limit myself when it comes to the method of, of victory. Now, that's not to say that I am not, you know, one of the most heaviest decision players, the biggest over players uh, when it comes to that type of stuff, because it, it's really the opposite. It's, I feel that this is going to go to decision so strongly. However, it could be a split. I'm not sure if judging is going to come into play. So it eliminates um, kind of variance when you do it that way. When you start playing props like that, although it mo is the most likely uh, thing to happen. It's not always the one that does. And so if you would be kind of upset with, you know, having the winning fighter, but not the method, I, I think that that can really be disheartening. Um, I think you could always, you know, kind of split your bet as well, have one pay for the other. But a lot of times you have to look at that line and see, is that path to victory built into the line and built into that prop? When we have heavy knockout artist guys, there is, you know, that is usually only what 10, 20 cents difference when they don't have another path to victory or by decision or, or that type of stuff as well. So, but you look at a guy like Manny Bermudez, who all he does is uh, submit people. It's probably likely going to be built into his line because if he wins, that's the only way that he has, you know, kind of shown a propensity to do so. Guys like Sergio Pettis winning decisions, Frankie Edgar, all that type of stuff. But it can be very disheartening very quickly to pick the right side, but not the right method and lose your entire bet completely. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I think that a lot of people just starting out and I can certainly understand this. And I mean, I, I was this way, you know, back in my infancy of sports betting, too, is that. A lot of people just get allergic to chalk. You know, they don't like the idea of laying a dollar seventy-five to win a dollar. You know, that that minus seventy-five line is something that they're just not comfortable with, something that they don't like. But I think that this, and, and in particular, something like UFC, where there are you know multiple paths to victory, it's not a bad thing to simplify the process and just be comfortable with laying that number. Yeah, and again, I am a huge proponent of flat betting. I am a huge proponent of open parlays. I am a huge proponent of two fighter or two team max uh, parlays. I think they get a very bad rap because the only ones that you see out there are these five, six, seven, eight teamers uh, that inevitably lose and they're sports book's best friend. And, and I understand that. But when it's done right and if you can be patient um, and if you hand, you know, value to me is value. And it's a very interesting word because. There's no value in a losing ticket a lot of the times if you don't know what to do with it or you don't apply it every single time. I always talk about that. I will routinely, uh, in the write-ups that I do or while talking with you, tell you, I expect this bet. Uh, this was a great example. The what, um, other fight that I lost last week was Betch Cohea at, I believe, plus 235. In the short term, I completely expected her to uh, lose that fight. However, the line was so off from the way that I made it that I had to take that value. It's the same reason that I'm going to be successful long-term 
fading, you know, Greg Hardy in his first fight philosophically or anyone coming in in their first fight. Yeah, I got lucky, but that comes into it when you're talking about things like experience, hometown judging, and, you know, people forget Betchko Hey was really kind of winning that fight handedly uh, before getting caught in submission. And those type of things really come into it. So I don't shy away from chalk. If something is minus 200 and I feel it should be minus 400, a great, great example was uh, Noradine Taleb. I, I sat here and said, you're getting a discount at this minus 235 or minus 335, whatever it was, uh, because he's 0-2 coming into this fight, fighting some of the best. And he is better absolutely everywhere. And I truthfully made that line about minus 5, minus 700. That's a great open parlay piece. You can flat bet it. Um, I wouldn't tell you to just look at the chalk and parlay, you know, round robin uh, in teams of twos blindly. Um, but that's where the next level of research comes in. All right. So we look at this women's featherweight fight here. Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer. Uh, I think you've got some fairly interesting opinions on this fight, don't you? Yeah, I really favor the underdog here. Felicia Spencer at 135. This is a bad, bad matchup for a girl like Megan Anderson. And for whatever reason, I, whenever I see Megan Anderson or see the name, I, I always she's always going to be linked uh, to Cyborg, I feel like. And it, it's so funny, though, how we kind of think of fighters kind of linked to others like that, right? And look, she, Megan Anderson was out-wrestled and outclassed on the mat from a girl, by a girl like Holly Holm. Now, yeah, she survived and get the submission um, loss, but that was, Holly Holm has never submitted anybody. So I, I don't really kind of, you know, put most into that look felicia spencer is uh, has been great um six and oh she has been carving everyone up um and she has a win over macy chazon who you know i feel is one of the best up-and-coming female knockout artists in the sport she's coming over from invicta um and she has just been an absolute killer i i get the experience factor i get why the line is slightly uh favoring megan anderson certainly would not lay the the dollar and a half there that that to me is absolutely crazy look spencer not really a true featherweight i get that um so she she may have some weight issues down the line may need to change i, I think that she could make 135 125 a lot is going to go in that into that for her long term however for this fight as long as she can kind of manage the cardio manage that type of stuff if she can get this fight to the mat, and she definitely should be able to, she is a legit black belt in BJJ. Megan Anderson is going to be lost. She has not made any significant improvements in her wrestling game. Um, and I just see this one as um, a Felicia Spencer uh, submission pretty fairly early, to be honest. I see this as kind of a first round sub now. When I say this, and I know it sounds that I'm, I'm so convincing, so I'm so convinced in this, and, and go lay this, and go go max bet it. Um, you know, there are path to victories for Anderson um, if it stays on the feet, and she has somehow made strides in her wrestling that I don't foresee her doing. So that is one factor. I just don't think this line is right. I think this is name value of a girl like Megan Anderson who's been around, not necessarily had success or done much, um, but the newcomer, Felicia Spencer, to me, is leaps and bounds. Um, and if she's able to get this fight to the ground, which I think she will, um, much like Carlos Jr., I think this one ends in a submission. All right, so we move on to the other welterweight fight here on the main card, Vicente Luque and Derek Krantz. Now, three days ago, it looked like Neil Magny was going to be in this fight, but Magny pops a positive test for a banned substance. Now Krantz gets in there, and obviously this is a very unique and interesting situation for both fighters. You want to talk about short notice. It doesn't get much shorter than this. No, it doesn't. But this is a uh, kind of a long time coming for a guy like Krantz, in, in my opinion. This kid has been dynamite. Let me start with this. 22, 20 of his 22 wins have come via stoppage. So on the first look at this, we have seen this. We saw this with Alex, uh, Alex White against Benuel Dariusha. A much similar line here. Um, so take that into account. There is something to be said for the letdown spot. Neil Magny was on a meteoric rise. Luke preparing for him. I would take a shot with the dog, Derek Krantz, at plus 450. I really would. Look, I, I think there's something to be said. And again, long term, when you do this type of thing, uh, when you start sprinkling on these kind of letdown spots, you know, one of my favorite type of situations is challengers coming off uh, a losing championship opportunity. It is one of my favorite angles in mixed martial arts. They just got their 
dreams shattered, their hearts broken, and then it's a hard get up spot right after start the journey over again. Now they're not starting, they don't go down to 15 in the rankings or whatever it is. Um, but when you see this type of fight, this is the ultimate letdown spot. And when you have a guy like Derek Krantz, who is again, 20 out of 22 finishes, look, Luke, I, I get the line. He is better absolutely everywhere. And there is a chance Krantz loses this fight handedly. And it is a mauling decision because Luke is that much better than the current version. But there is also a chance, again, uh, bringing up the Darius situation where he is not prepared for him, takes him lightly, and Kranz shocks the world. So uh, I would take the value of plus 450 for a small stake on that side. But look, Luke is better everywhere. Kranz is likely to lose this fight up until he ends it, if possible. I don't think that it's possible that he wins a decision. Um, but it's worth it. A Kranz inside the distance prop probably pays even better. So. Well, this almost seems like one of those where you've got two heavyweights sort of in a fight, and you're just kind of looking at the dog because – you, know, you expect a finish in this fight. And, you know, I mean, at, at that point, it, it could very well be Kranz. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's definitely more pass to victory for a guy like Luke. I think all three are on the table um, for Kranz. I, I think it has to be a stoppage. I don't see him being able to um, necessarily submit Luke off the bat unless it's, you know, drop him with something and then just finishes with grounded pound TKO or, or takes the neck or, or the back, which would be shocking. But I think that Kranz definitely has the fight, the puncher's chance here. And, you know, look, I, I, again, I don't think Krantz can win a decision. I don't think that's on the table for him. Luke certainly could survive this with a, even a, a split. And I think if it's anything close, it's going to go to Luke because of name value. Uh, but certainly worth a little poke at that dog at plus 450. And this is one of those things, too. You, know, you mentioned Neil Magny. I mean, he is a guy that, that generally does go the distance or at least goes very deep into fights. So if you're Luke, that's what you're kind of planning for. And then four days before the fight card, you know, then you have to suddenly transition to a guy that is a stoppage artist. It's a different type of mindset, a different type of mentality, and probably a different scouting that you need to do as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you'd have to get your team to go dig through the archives of everything on his regional scene. You know, Krantz was supposed to be on um, the Contender Series um, after knocking out Justin Patterson at LFA. Um, and he has, again, he, he's been... Known for that explosive finish. Look, Luke uh, on the other side, I, I really don't want to sound like I'm taking anything away from him. This is mostly a numbers play. And again, a fight that I fully expect Luke, or I fully expect to lose, I should say. Um, he's been running through the welterweight midcard. Uh, I mean, my God, it, it's been four straight opponents absolutely killing him along the way. You know, um, Brian Barbarina and so on. So, look, I get it. It's just the angle. We can kind of, I can polish this up as much. It's more a numbers play um, than anything else. And he has a much better, by, uh, you know, with all the outside things going on that you just talked about, when you're t you're mostly you know you're planning for a point fighting type of stick and move style, this is the opposite when it comes to Krantz. In my opinion, he's going to come at him and he's going to kill and be killed. So when it's kill or be killed, you should always look to the plus four fifty underdog. You know. All right, so let's look at this lightweight fight here between Charles Oliveira and Nick Lentz, and then we'll bounce around the card for the rest of the segment here. But I know that you specifically wanted to mention this fight because there's a pretty interesting background to it. Yeah, I really don't understand why this fight is happening in theory. Um, I get it, but it, it makes no sense, right? This is, look, this is the third time they're fighting. You're getting a rare kind of non-championship uh, trilogy type of fight between Charles Oliveira and Nick Lentz that uh, nobody asked for, but yet here we are. Look, Oliveira, again, submitting him both times. That's what Charles Oliveira does. He is one of the most accomplished submission artists in UFC history with 18 submissions. And guess what? Two of those... I don't care what the scorecards say. And what I mean by that is the first one was overturned due, an, due to an illegal knee um, to a no contest. Should be 19 submissions um, uh, for Charles Oliveira. This fight ended the same time, the second time as the first time. I have no doubt that it will end. I don't want to say no doubt. Anything's possible. But I don't see how anything could be different the third time. This is the same fight we've seen time and time again. Yet here we are again. So... It's just interesting that we're kind of getting a trilogy that nobody asked for in a fight that has been so decided. Uh, you know, again, I don't really care what happens after the fight. Uh, you know, uh, you cash on Brock Lesnar, whether he pops, or you cash on John Jones after he po or before he pops. And, and it's the same type of thing here with Oliveira. You're going to cash regardless of if it's you know, overturned down the line after, which is something that we've seen. So doesn't matter about vacated wins, tickets all cash the same. And, and that's the great thing about sports betting here. So this is pretty cut and dry. I get the minus 365. I don't know how much better a submission prop is going to be for the hat trick for Oliveira, honestly, just because that's usually so built into Oliveira's line because that's what he does. 18 submissions will get you not a lot of juice when it comes to looking for, you know, 
pass to victory in, in handicapping the unknowns here. So unless Lentz has made amazing strides in the wrestling in, in since they've fought, you know, the first and second time, which I have no reason to believe he has watching his last couple fights. Uh, this to me is pretty cut and dry for the hat trick for Charles Oliveira via submission. All right. So I will direct us to one fight on the prelim card, and then we can bounce around with anything else you want to talk about. You mentioned when we were talking earlier, the Zach Cummings and Trevin Giles fight is one that kind of you know, sort of fits your MO as a UFC handicapper. So what is it about that fight? Yeah, again, eliminating variance. Zach Cummings is one of the uh, most boring fighters in the UFC. That being said, he is also one of the most durable. Can somewhat be said for the same like a guy like, like Trevin Giles. These are two a type of guys that I love to target when it comes to the over. Yeah, it's usually juiced. Again, you can find a, a women's fight to put that in with. You could find something else, um, an open parlay towards the over. Um, you know, whoever you believe will win by decision. I think this is a very, very close fight. Um, much more than the, um, you know, I mean, the line at plus 130 for Cummings and Giles minus 150. I would almost kind of flip that. I have it basically about a pick, I'm honestly. So, look, the issue here is has always been um, Cummings chin. And the problem here is that Giles, I'm not necessarily sure, is going to be the um, one to stop that. Cummings has always been super durable. So it's when you have durability versus durability, it ends in decision 99% of the time, in my opinion. So it's just stylistically two guys that want to go in there. They want a dirty box. They want to hold each other up against the cage, stay on the feet. You don't have to worry about the submission um, usually. Uh, so it's it's very just... Cut and dry, philosophically, two guys that I love to target. I love durable guys that have issues, um, kind of, you know, either you know being finished or, or, or that type of stuff. So Giles should be able to, um, you know, they fought 10 times. I think it's the, each fighter wins six, but I think that they go to the decision nine out of 10. I, I really do. So Cummings being that durable is a huge advantage when you necessarily don't have to worry about one fighter going down in, in Giles with his style as well. It just... Really fits to a decision, split decision, one way or the other. I'm not going to sit there and worry about that. I'm just going to like it to go to a decision. All right, so as we look around the rest of the card, we missed one fight on the main card. We got a handful of other prelims. Anything else stand out to you about this card? Really, there's not a lot here. I mean, the, the big chalk, I think, that we can kind of talk about just because it makes some sense from a philosophical standpoint to talk about it. You know, Arce, um, Hot Chocolate at two, minus 245, Danny Roberts, Desmond Green. You know, this Desmond Green fight really highlights the the Nordin Taleb type of thing that I was talking about, where a guy is just so much better everywhere. Um, and this is the type of line that I was expecting with a guy like Taleb, or Taleb but you're getting it here with Green. So I, I think that if you're... You know, I think that an Arce and Green prop likely cashes for you despite the juice. And if it loses, tip your cap, flat bet it, and move on. You know, it's you don't have to just because you see that you don't have to lay your five to six to seven to one, no matter how you're parlaying it. But this one, I, I really do it within the prelim portion. I think that the hot, the chalk really does hold true. There's just not a lot of paths to victories when it comes to these very sizable underdogs. The last one I'm going to talk about, Aspen Ladd, um, Sierra Eubanks. I mean, this is another one. I mean, this is another uh, rematch. Lad has always been on the cusp of making that next step. She has great finishing power, so much potential, but can never put it together here. And this is something that I have seen. While both fighters have grown, they've kind of almost grown. Um, I think that Lad certainly gets the more hype um, for a variety of different reasons, but I just don't see anything different from how it ended the first time. And this should be Aspen Lad by decision. So. Not a lot to go off of here when it comes to the prelims in terms of value and all that type of stuff, in my opinion. Chris Pina, who's working and fine on the Sports Gambling Podcast and on Twitter, at Christian Pina, P-I-N-A. Of course, check out his preview for this fight card over at bangthebook.com. Christian, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much, bud. And we'll talk to you again in two weeks. Enjoy the fights, my friend. We'll talk soon. There you go. There's Christian Pina of the Sports Gambling Podcast. And again, at Christian Pina, P-I-N-A, on Twitter. Make sure you check out that Preakness podcast. Also, my most recent edition of the Betters Box. We'll have another one coming your way on Monday. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again on Monday.